today we are going to start a new topic, it is a solid liquid separation. This is generally the first step in a downstream process, it can happen immediately after the fermentation or just after a bio transformation. If you look at fermentation, you are going to have dead biomass, cell debris, salts, especially salts which has precipitated out, there could be suspended solids. So, all needs to be removed, we do not want to go into any other downstream without removing all these. Hence, the solid liquid separation takes place uh, at this particular stage. If you have immobilized uh, bio catalyst, for example, you have immobilized an enzyme, then you want to resort to filtration, remove the enzyme and then maybe recycle it again, because especially in the enzyme catalyzed uh, processes, the cost of the enzyme is very, very high. You do not want to throw it out, so you may like to take it back into the bioreactor. So, in such situations also, you would like to resort to solid liquid separation. If your product is inside the cells, that means is if it is intracellular, then your medium or the broth is of no interest for you. It is the cells which are of interest for you. So, in such a situation, you need to harvest the cells, that means collect all the cells and then resort to cell breakage, which we talked about in the past uh, two lectures uh, and so on actually. So, in such a situation, you are interested in the cells and not in the liquid. So, if your products are in the extracellular, you are not interested in the cells, but you are interested in the extracellular medium. So, in all these conditions, you need to resort to a solid liquid separation. There are different types of solid liquid separations we are going to talk about you must have heard about uh, things like sedimentation, settling, flocculation, filtration, centrifugation. And in filtration, you have different types of uh, filtration techniques. Similarly, with centrifugation, you are going to have different types of uh, centrifugation techniques. So, we will look at each one of them slightly more in detail in the next uh, course of the lectures. Let us look at something called sedimentation. So, what are you doing in sedimentation is, you are allowing the particles to settle down due to gravitational forces. So, initially the particles may be in a suspended form, um, but you are allowing enough time, so that the particles can settle down due to gravitational forces, that is what sedimentation is actually. So, if the particles are uh, denser than the liquid, what will happen? you are going to have all the particles settle down. So, at the bottom you are going to have a very concentrated um, slurry mostly of solids and at the top you are going to have a, a mostly clear liquid. So, that is called supernatant and uh, you may just take the bottom which is going to be very strong in the solids. So, especially if you are interested in uh, separation of blood cells from plasma if you are going to manufacture plasma protein, removal of bacteria from viruses uh, and viruses from uh, protein solutions. In such situations, you are going to resort to this type of uh, sedimentation. In fact, sedimentation is cheapest process. All you need is a large uh, vessel uh, which can do this job and enough uh, settling time, so that the solids can settle down comfortably um, and you get a good separation between the solids and the clear supernatant liquid at the top. So, the settling time of the solids depend on couple of important parameters, physical properties of the solid that means, uh, things like uh, density, the size of the solid, the porosity of the solid and the driving force for settling. That means, the difference in the densities between the solid and the liquid. If the difference in the density is between solid and liquid is very large, then you are going to have a good settling. If the difference between the density of solid and liquid is very small, then settling is going to be very slow. So, you need to give enough time. So, under dilute condition, 
the law which governs the settling of a solid is called Stokes law. You must have all studied Stokes law long time back in your uh, maybe first year or even before in your schooling as well actually. So, Stokes law gives you an idea of the terminal settling velocity of a solid particle suspended in a medium under dilute condition. Why do you say dilute condition? If the slurry is uh, very high that means, if the slurry concentration is very high there could be interaction between one settling solid and another settling solid. So, it is not going to be completely free from the interaction that is why we call it dilute conditions. So, what are the various forces that are acting on a solid which is freely suspended in a liquid? Many things are happening. One is the buoyancy, you must have all about heard about the buoyancy of the solid. So, buoyancy depends upon the density of the liquid as well as the volume displaced by the solid, correct? We have studied uh, I think in our school. Then there is a drag force, the force which is trying to slow down the movement of the solid and this depends upon the surface area of the solid, correct? And then when the solid is settling, why is it settling? It is because of the gravitational forces. So, if all these match, then we are saying that the solid is reaching a terminal settling velocity. So, as soon as a, a solid enters a, a large liquid medium, it is not going to reach a terminal settling velocity. But once all these forces balance, it is going to reach a terminal settling velocity and that velocity is going to be constant. That determines how long the solid will take to reach the bottom of the vessel. So, why is it important? Once I know what is the terminal settling velocity and if I know the size of my vessel, that means if I know the height of my vessel, I will know how long it will take for the solid to reach the bottom. So, I can decide that I should carry out the sedimentation or settling for so many minutes or hours depending upon the terminal settling velocity and the dimensions of my vessel. So, if you balance all this, you get a relationship which is shown above and uh, this is based on your Stokes law. This is the terminal settling velocity v on the left hand side and then we have uh, many terms on the right hand side which, which determines the terminal settling velocity. The d, the small d is the diameter of the particle and uh, you have some term in the bracket that this is the driving force difference in the density between the solid and the and the liquid. So, this is the driving force. If this number is very large, the terminal settling velocity is going to be large. If this number is very small, this is going to be small. And at the bottom, we have a term mu, which is the viscosity of the fluid. So, if the viscosity of the fluid is very large, um, that means it is preventing, it is dragging the solid from settling. So, if the viscosity of the fluid is very low, then it will settle down nicely. So, if I am doing settling in uh, aqueous medium, plain water, it may be very large, but then when I have cell debris, dead biomass, DNA and so on, my viscosity of the fluid goes up because of uh, uh, these, these biomolecules. So, the settling will become much slower. So, if you are carrying out experiments in your lab and uh, you test the settling of a solid in water and when you test it out in your fermentation broth, both are going to be very different. So, you have to be very careful on that because the fermentation broth will contain all the cell debris, intracellular media, intracellular material and um, so the viscosity goes up and hence the settling velocity will be less unlike doing a settling study in a pure water medium. Okay. So, this uh, equation tells you that the velocity is uh, directly proportional to the diameter square of the particle, inversely proportional to the viscosity, directly proportional to the difference in density and g of course, is the acceleration due to gravity. You all know that right. Um, so, this is valid only for dilute uh, conditions and for very low Reynolds number. You all know what is a Reynolds number right. Reynolds number is, uh, is a function of the physical properties of the uh, particle. 
So, Reynolds number is given by d u rho by mu, d is the diameter of the particle, u is the velocity, uh, rho is the density of the fluid and mu is the viscosity of the fluid and it is valid only when Reynolds number is less than 1. That means, at, at very very low velocities, not at very high velocities. If the velocity is very high, you are going to create turbulence, then uh, we cannot use this particular relationship. So, the velocity has to be low, then this particular Stokes law is valid. Okay, this is uh, with respect to settling taking place uh, under the influence of gravity, but suppose I have a centrifugal force as is the case in a centrifuge, then how will that uh, settling vary? If you look at the previous equation if you remember and this particular equation you see that there is one small difference the omega square r term here, okay. the omega square r term whereas, in the settling in the influence of just gravity you have g c. So, that is the only difference between um, settling taking place under the influence of gravity, settling taking place under the influence of centrifugal force so, that is the only difference, because the centrifugal force um, is almost equal to the gravity. Now, here if you look at the centrifugal force it is um, made up of two terms the omega that is the angular rotation of the centrifuge radians per uh, second and r, r is the distance of the solid from the center of the axis of the centrifuge. Okay. So, if the r is large that means, if the particle is far away from the center of the axis of the rotation then your settling velocity also will be high. It is like a centrifugal force if, if you are very far away from the center you can feel the force much higher right. Okay. So, if I have very large rotation speeds then I can have very large terminal settling velocity. So, that is the advantage of a centrifugal settling when compared to a gravitational settling. In a gravitational settling we cannot go beyond g right g c is number fixed whereas, here in a centrifugal settling I can keep on increasing the r p m of my centrifuge. So, by increasing r p m of my centrifuge my omega goes up. So, I can achieve very high terminal settling velocity that is why in my in my laboratory generally I do not do gravitational separation of uh, cells and broth. I use a centrifuge by doing that I am creating very large force. So, that this this separation velocity is very high understand. So, there is something called a sedimentation coefficient which uh, is a function of all the material properties which we talked about actually. Okay. So, the sedimentation coefficient is nothing but uh, uh, the molecular weight of the material or the solid which we are talking about and then particle specific molar volume, particle specific molar volume is nothing but uh, inverse of the particle density and then uh, we have something called the frictional factor. Okay. Frictional factor is a function of the um, physical surface properties of the solid. Now, so the sedimentation coefficient of a particle in a liquid medium can be expressed in terms of many operating parameters in a centrifuge. For example, if I do it in a centrifuge separation and uh, it is depend upon the omega the r, r is nothing but the distance um, of the particle from the center and v is the sedimentation velocity. So, the sedimentation coefficient of differs when I am performing the settling under the influence of gravity or when you have a centrifugal force taking place actually. 
Okay, there are several uh, sedimentation coefficient values that are given for a wide range of material. Okay, for example, if you see cytochrome C, sedimentation coefficient is about 1.1 second. Um, collagen, you are talking about in terms of uh, 6 seconds. Uh, if you are talking about uh, tobacco mosaic virus, 198 seconds. Human serum albumin, you are talking in terms of uh, 4.6 seconds. Okay. So, you can see large variation in sedimentation coefficient almost uh, starting from uh, 1 second going up to around 200 seconds. So, um, there is a 200 times difference in this uh, sedimentation coefficient. So, the sedimentation coefficient also determines the terminal settling velocity as uh, I had mentioned before actually. So, sedimentation coefficient depends uh, determines the terminal settling velocity. So, in a settling tank what do you do? You introduce a feed slurry which contains uh, solid as well as the liquid and there is a large tank and you allow the solids to settle down based uh, on the, the terminal settling velocity. The solids will take so much time from the top and reach the bottom. So, in the bottom you are going to have concentrated solids which can be slowly discharged and on the top we have the supernatin which will be mostly clear liquid which can be taken up and then um, you can do other downstream uh, operations. So, this is a simple setup for performing a settling operation or a sedimentation operation. So, you do not need extra energy uh, to carry out this uh, particular uh, unit operation and uh, you do not need any fancy equipments also for carrying out this unit operation. So, that is why it is advantageous, but then we need to put in lot of time because the settling takes place because of the uh, gravitational forces. So, the terminal settling velocities are also much less uh, hence time also is much higher unlike a centrifuge where you can achieve very high settling velocities because of the omega square r term coming instead of the g c term coming in uh, settling in a um, gravitational situation. Now, another technique for separating solids and um, liquid is called uh, flocculation. So, when you have particles very very small particles 0.1 micron size particles, they do not seem to come closer and uh, agglomerate, but they seem to be moving around inside the liquid medium because of the electrostatic forces and electrostatic repulsions. So, the because the particles are so small, they do not get enough terminal settling velocity for them to settle down. So, that is a big problem. So, what do you do? You need to neutralize these electrostatic forces. So, if you can neutralize these electrostatic forces, they can come together, they can collide with each other and they will start agglomerating. Once they agglomerate, they can settle down. nicely if they are very heavy or they can form big lumps and stay on the top of the uh, liquid medium itself. So, they form flock or they sometimes they are also called uh, flakes. So, the flocculation is not exactly like uh, precipitation, there is a difference between flocculation and precipitation. Precipitation happens when the concentration of the solid matches with the solubility. So, beyond that value whatever is present will come out as a solid in the liquid medium. So, that is called uh, precipitation, whereas here the concentration in a flocculation is much less than the solubility limit in the liquid. That means, they have still not uh, uh, you can still dissolve that solid if you use some other means the liquid medium has not reached is saturation limit for the solid actually. So, once you um, remove the electrostatic repulsions and forces, the solids get aggregated, they form flock. So, they can either float on the top 
forming big lumps or flocks they are called or flakes they are called or if they are very heavy when compared to the liquid they can settle down at the bottom. Then it is almost like sedimentation the bottom will contain concentrated solids top will be containing the clear liquid. So, how do you do this? You can add large number of different types of uh, chemicals which can neutralize the charges present on the surface of these fine solids actually. So, during the flocculation process two things happen neutralization and bridging. So, these are the two different mechanisms that take place during this process actually. So, you can also call it agglomeration, you can also call it coagulation. So, all these names are synonymous to each other actually. So, many flocculants has been tested and depending upon the uh, type of solids you are processing you can use different types of flocculants. So, when you say type of solids the type of charges that are generated by the solid surface you use different types of flocculants actually. So, they are generally chemicals. Flocculants are also used in water treatment chemicals quite a lot actually. So, uh, water before uh, um, it is sent to domestic use generally they use uh, flocculation type of uh, downstream to remove whatever suspended solids that are present. And then the water for domestic purpose is chlorinated to kill all the viruses okay, because uh, the water will contain lot of fine solids which will not settle down actually and you cannot filter this fine solid they are so small it is not possible to use any um, type of filtration. So, that way flocculation is adopted. So, generally these uh, flocculants are multivalent cations of aluminum, iron, calcium, magnesium. So, lot of multivalent. So, it can be even acids, bases, simple electrolytes, photoelectrolytes all these they all promote coagulation and they also help the flocculation of the broth. If, if you are performing um, downstream after a fermentation operation. For example, in the manufacture of uh, um, um, ethanol after the fermentation you will find suspended solid and uh, um, which will be just floating and uh, it will not settle down because of the size as well as because they are lighter. So, there you need to resort to some sort of a flocculation type of downstream process. Sometimes even long chain polymer flocculants are also added. For example, polyacrylamides they have also been tested as a flocculant or a flocculating agent and they have been found to be very good. Of course, there are some uh, drawbacks if you are resorting to membrane filtration after flocculation these flocculants may go and foul your membrane surfaces. So, that is one problem actually and the other thing is um, the flocculant itself could be a um, material which may be destroying your proteins or any other product of interest. So, that is a big problem we need to consider. So, there are different types of flocculants, chemical flocculants, natural flocculants. As the name implies chemical flocculants are synthetic uh, chemicals which are synthesized in your uh, or manufactured whereas, natural flocculants are naturally available uh, material. Aluminum chlorohydrate, aluminum sulphate, calcium oxide, uh, ferric chloride all these are possible chemical flocculants even iron sulphate that is uh, ferrous sulphate. Whereas, if you look at the natural ones chitosan, olifera seeds, papain um, and a large number of seeds have been tested and uh, some more chemical these are all polyacrylamide as I mentioned is a polymeric, sodium aluminate, sodium silicate they are some more chemical flocculants. So, a large number of chemical flocculants are available in the market and uh, one could test out uh, depending upon the type of application. So, what are the factors which influence this flocculation process? Large number of factors influence the flock. The type of uh, coagulant or flocculant used 
to perform this operation, the amount of coagulant you are using, the pH because I mentioned flocculation happens because of the charges and because of the electrostatic forces. So, the pH has a very strong effect on charge. So, the uh, pH can either enhance or speed up the flock formation or they can retard or slow down the flock. The coagulant feed concentration, how much of uh, coagulant feed I need to add. So, what other additives I am going to add apart from the coagulant? Example, am I going to add any other polymeric material? Uh, am I going to add some adsorbent? So, all these needs to be also uh, considered because they all will have an effect on the your efficiency of flocculation process. And then sequence of addition. So, am I going to add uh, one flocculating agent followed by after certain time period am I going to add again um, the same and what will be the uh, gap between each uh, addition or dosing. So, all these will have an effect on the efficiency of the process actually. And then once I have added this uh, flocculant, uh, how, ha how hard am I mixing the flocculant with the broth and uh, what is the duration of mixing that will also have an effect on that. What type of devices we use for performing these mixing operations? Are we creating any velocity gradients during this uh, flocculation stage? How long the flocculator? Uh, the material remains in the flocculation uh, or a flocculator. Type of uh, stirring I used, am I using agitator? What type of agitator I use? And then the flocculator geometry, am I using a cylindrical vessel for performing the flocculation or operation, or am I having a conical vessel, and so on actually. So, what are the different steps in uh, flocculation? So, initially at time say time equal to 0, you are adding your slurry which contains the suspended solids. Okay. Then after some time you are adding your flocculant, then um, that is dosing your flocculant, then you may be agitating and then stopping the agitation, uh, allowing the flocks to form. And then once the flocks are formed and if the flocks are heavier than the liquid, what will happen? They will start settling down and the bottom will have the flocks and the top will be the clear liquid. Okay. But whereas, if the flocks are lighter than the liquid, then they will be floating as two layers. You will have the clear liquid at the bottom and the flocks will be at the top. So, we need to just remove the flocks at the top and we can collect all the clear liquid from the bottom. So, depending upon whether the um, flocks that is forming is um, denser than the liquid medium or whether it is lighter than the liquid medium, um, the flocks will be either uh, settling at the bottom or will remain at the top. So, you have to add the fl flocculating agent, you need to perform certain agitation, you need to allow the flocks to coagulate or come together. Um, if it is going to be settling, then you need to give some more time for them to settle down and reach the bottom of your flocculator. So, there are many small small time steps which are involved. So, the overall cycle time is a combination of all these or a summation of all these various times. There is another technique which uh, also can help uh, the flocculation process that is called the air flotation. Here again you have a very fine solids which are not coming as flocks and settling down. You do not want to add uh, any chemical to do that and the solids may be um, lighter than the liquid that means, the densities uh, of density of the solid may be less than the liquid density. So, in such a situation you may be passing air and the air may help to form flocks or, or froth, which may float at the top of the liquid layer. The broth or these 
concentrated solids or the froth can be skimmed out from the top. It is almost like the of the froth that is forming uh, on top of uh, milk. It can be skimmed out and the bottom will be the clear liquid. So, the advantage in this technique is you are not adding any flocculant. Uh, all you need is uh, air which needs to be pumped from the bottom. This type of technique is quite uh, used uh, um, in uh, environmental applications if you want to remove solids which uh, are which are not at, at high concentrations um, and which are very light. The next uh, solid liquid separation processes is the filtration. So, there are different types of uh, filtration and uh, we can use uh, different type of material for performing the filtration process. You can use a cloth, we can use a metal discs, we can use a polymeric uh, membranes, we can use uh, fibers, candles with fine pores like at home where uh, water purification system they use they have candles ceramic candles um, which will have fine pores which will hold uh, the solids uh, and the liquid passes through it and uh, you get clear liquid. Sometimes stainless steel candles are also used if uh, the solids um, is very abrasive. So, the solids will be retained and the liquid flows through. So, we all have seen a filter for a very very long time at various locations for various purposes. So, it is nothing new for us. There are different types of designs for filtration. So, you can have a filter medium, this could be your cloth or this could be a metal sintered uh, disc or even membrane. So, the feed slurry is fed here, the cake is forming here and the liquid flows through the slurry and the clear liquid comes on the other side here. So, this is a typical design of a filtration assembly. So, this is a batch operation that means, uh, after some time there will be so much of cake that is formed here, uh, the liquid flow will get slower and slower and after some time there would not be any liquid flow. So, what do we have to do? We need to, we need to stop the filtration process and uh, we need to clear the surface of your uh, um, cloth and then restart the whole process once again actually. Okay. Another design, this is called a plate and frame design. That means, we have plates here and we have the cloth which is supported between two plates. So, the slurry flows through it and uh, the solids are retained and the clear liquid flows. So, this is called a plate and frame. So, I can have many plates and frames in parallel, so that I can perform this uh, particular task uh, on a higher scale. The third design is uh, your candle filter, this is almost uh, like uh, the setup which you may have in your household. Okay. So, you have a candle, a porous candle, it could be a ceramic, it could be even stainless steel. So, the speed slurry comes in and then uh, the liquid flows through solids are retained because of the size of the pores and the clear liquid goes down. So, you see different designs of uh, filtration where you can separate solids and liquid. In all these designs if you see once the amount of solid build up is very high liquid flow will stop then you need to clean the surface of the filter so that you can again start the process once more. So, it is almost like a batch operation, it may run for one day, two days, three days, even ten days and after that you need to clean your um, filter surface. So, this depends upon the 
the concentration of the solids present in your slurry. There are two ways by which I could do this job. I can do it through pressure or I can do it through vacuum. So, for example, this is your filtration assembly. I have the filter medium here and uh, I am feeding the slurry at high pressure. So, the cake is formed on top of my filter medium and the clear liquid is flowing down. So, I can increase the pressure of the pump thereby I can force more liquid to flow through. In this design, I am applying a vacuum on the downstream of the filtration setup. So, I have the filter medium here, the slurry comes here, the liquid is sucked by the vacuum pump present here and the cake settles down at the top. So, I can increase the vacuum so that I can force more liquid to flow through the filter. So, this is a pressure system and this is a vacuum system. So, the amount of pressure I can apply depends upon the, the filter medium. If I am using a cloth, cloth might not be able to take very high pressure whereas, if I am using a stainless steel uh, filter then it may take up very high pressure. So, I can apply very high pressures if I have a stainless steel type of filter. Another design is called the rotary drum filter, where I have a rotating drum and this rotating drum is immersed inside a bath containing the slurry. Slurry means I have the solid and the liquid. So, the drum is slowly rotating and this there is a vacuum inside the drum. So, the liquid gets sucked inside and the solids are retained at the top and generally the solids attach to the surface when the drum is immersed inside the slurry tank. So, here you have a wet cake. Now, if the solids contain some impurities which you would like to remove, we perform something called washing. I can wash it with water or I can wash it with solvent which will remove the impurity. So, here I am washing and this is again sucked inside through the drum and here we allow the solids to dry and finally, here we are cutting the solids out using a cutting knife. So, the solids sort of get scraped out of the rotating drum and once more the drum gets immersed inside the slurry tank and once more um, the slurry gets sucked in that means the liquid gets sucked in and the solids form a cake and the cake once more goes up which gets washed which gets dried which gets cut. So, this happens continuously. So, I can do this type of rotary drum filter operation in a continuous mode. So, I can continuously keep on adding slurry inside this uh, slurry holder and I can continuously get wet solid out. So, the advantage of this is continuous operation number 1. Number 2, I can wash the solid using a medium like a water or solvent which will remove some impurities that are present in my solid. So, that is uh, advantage number 2 with this setup. We are going to talk about each one of these uh, um, unit operation uh, in more detail and we will also look at the uh, design equations for designing this type of uh, setup. Let us also look at some more uh, solid liquid separating uh, units. The next one is a tubular bowel centrifuge. This operates based on centrifugal force. So, you have a ball inside which rotates at very high rpm. So, you are sending in a feed slurry which contains both your solid and the liquid and because this is rotating and the solids 
face a, a centrifugal force. So, they are thrown out and they form a cake at the surface of this cylindrical vessel and uh, you get uh, the clear liquid out here. So, the rotating bowel starts slowly collecting the cake. So, once the cake is built up we need to stop this uh, particular unit operation and you need to remove all the solids. So, this is called a uh, bowel centrifuge. This is good for very dilute uh, slurry solutions not for very concentrated slurry solution because the cake build up will be so fast you need to stop start stop start and so on actually. So, this is very good for um, dilute solutions this is called a tubular bowel centrifuge. So, you have a long tube um, which rotates at a very high rpm the solids attach to the walls of this rotating cylindrical tube and the liquid flows out. The next design is called the disc uh, stack centrifuge. You have discs which are rotating. So, the slurry comes in and then slurry starts flowing through the discs because of the way the discs are uh, positioned the slurry flows through the discs and uh, they are thrown out. The solids because of the centrifugal force reach the outer layer surface of the centrifuge and they are collected and the liquid flows from the central shaft or the central portion. So, the solids are thrown out and they reach the surface outer surface of the centrifuge and they are collected at this position whereas, the clear liquid uh, flows out from the central portion this is called a disc stack centrifuge. So, here the, these discs help the slurry to flow in a centrifugal direction. So, there are two types possibly uh, on centrifuges one is the, uh, the bowel centrifuge which is a cylindrical bowel and the other one is the disc centrifuge which has got a disc located a positioned in certain angle. So, that the liquid flows and then uh, the solids settle down or remain at the outer portion of the centrifuge and the liquid flows out from the central portion. You can also use a centrifuge for filtration also that is called a centrifugal filter. So, what you do is if the the cylindrical surface of the centrifuge has fine pores. So, as soon as the liquid and the solid reach the cylindrical portion the solid will get retained whereas, the liquid will flow through these pores and come out. So, it is almost like a normal filtration only difference is here the forces are very high. So, because of the centrifugal force the liquid is pushed out towards the periphery solid settle down on the inner surface of the centrifuge and the liquid flows through this solid bed and then they are collected outside the centrifuge. So, this is called a centrifugal filter. So, the advantage of centrifugal filter we can process more uh, slurries because uh, unlike a normal filter um, here the amount of uh, driving force you can achieve will be much higher when compared to a normal filter because in a normal filter if it is a pressure filter you are applying certain pressure whereas, here we are talking about very high gravity very high centrifugal forces that can be achieved. And also if you have a very large diameter centrifugal filter uh, if the diameters are large again the centrifugal forces also will be very large. So, you can achieve very high driving force in centrifugal filter. Okay. So, the rate of filtration of a slurry through a bed depends upon several parameters and we will look at uh, these in more detail. Now, it is proportional to the area of your filtration setup it will be proportional to your pressure gradient it will be proportional or inversely proportional to the bed, bed thickness and also inversely proportional to the viscosity. So, 
So, the rate of filtration or the velocity of the liquid flowing through the bed will be proportional to your uh, delta p and uh, it will be inversely proportional to your viscosity and uh, bed thickness and this is called the Darcy's law. This is a very simple law and um, it does not consider many parameters, it just uh, considers it as an ideal situation and uh, it comes out with a relationship called V is equal to k delta p divided by mu B d. So, k is a constant delta p is a pressure drop across the bed and uh, B d is your bed thickness. So, if I, if I know the k, I will be able to calculate the velocity through the bed. So, that is the main advantage of uh, having a Darcy's law and if I know the velocity through the bed, that means I can calculate the throughput through the bed. As you can see, it is inversely proportional to viscosity. That means, if the viscosity of the medium is uh, very large, my velocity is going to be very slow. That means, my throughput will be very slow and again, if the bed thickness is very large, my um, velocity is going to be very low. Of course, this is valid only for Reynolds number less than 5. I talked about Reynolds number. Reynolds number is a uh, number which is a term describing the physical, physical properties of the medium as well as the solid. So, it is generally it is defined as the, the diameter of the solid, the velocity, uh, the density of the fluid divided by the viscosity of the fluid. Here you have one extra term coming here 1 minus epsilon, epsilon is the porosity of the bed which comes into this, but normally Reynolds number will be diameter of the solid multiplied by velocity multiplied by the density of the fluid divided by the viscosity of the fluid. But here we are also considering the porosity of the bed because um, the liquid is flowing through a porous bed. So, the porosity term also comes in here. Okay. Now, this Darcy's law is valid only when uh, you have Reynolds number less than 5 otherwise it is not valid. Okay. Now, we have uh, the velocity of liquid through the bed. Now, we want to calculate the throughput through the bed. How do we go about do that, doing that? So, let us go do some mathematics into that. So, imagine that I have a, a slurry of batch V that means, uh, the total volume of filtrate I want to filter. Then the average rate of filtration will be d v by d t correct. So, I want to filter some so many liters of liquid in so many hours. Okay. So, so many liters divided by so many hours gives me the average rate of filtration. In reality, um, it will not be constant because initially filtration will be small as you keep accumulating solids the filtration will be slow, but we will take it as an average filtration rate. So, it is d v by d t. So, the velocity will be equal to rate divided by area where area is the filtration area. Okay. Now, we can introduce this into the Darcy's law because uh, I showed uh, Darcy's law where uh, it is velocity is a function of uh, delta p that is the pressure drop or pressure gradient and divided by the bed thickness and uh, mu as the viscosity of the fluid. Okay. So, I can combine this equation with the Darcy's equation. So, by doing that I will get an equation like this d v by d t v as I said is the quantity of the slurry quantity means volume of the slurry that needs to be filtered k is some constant a is the area of the filtration surface delta p is my driving force divided by mu viscosity of the medium b d is the thickness of the bed. Generally the filter cloth or the filter medium also will offer some resistance to flow and generally we can neglect that it is not uh, very high. So, we can neglect that 
So, if you neglect that term, then we can get very simple relationship. Okay. If you do not neglect that term, the relationship becomes slightly complicated. We will look at uh, both these type of uh, approaches. Now, there is another aspect which needs to be considered, uh, which is called the compressibility of the bed. Some solid material under pressure will get compressed and uh, some solid material under pressure will not get compressed. For example, if you take uh, chalk, if I put pressure it gets compressed, if you, for example, if you take clay when I put pressure it gets compressed, whereas if you take sand whether I put high pressure or whether I put uh, medium or low pressure it does not get compressed. So, there is a factor that is known as compressibility and the equations filtration equations will change depending upon whether it is a compressible bed or whether it is a non compressible bed. The equations will look very different. 